talking. Good morning. I am assuming that based on the intro video, you can guess what our topic is going to be today. Now, here's what I got to say to you. Listen, it's kind of crazy if you're here for the first time today, and I, I, I apologize to you. We've got family here for baptism. It's your first time. Uh, certainly, there are guests who are here for the first time, and, and you're probably thinking to yourself, what have I gotten myself into, right? And, and, and here's the deal. I realize this will be your first impression of OBC, and obviously, there is a risk there for, for us to talk about the topic that we're going to discuss today. But here's what I would say to you. If you are brand new to OBC, maybe you've only been here a few weeks or, or whatever it is, but listen to me. We're not like most churches, okay? And we're not like most churches in a lot of ways, but I, I need you to understand that what we're about to do right now, this is actually something we do every year in the month of November, and believe it or not, this is actually not something that we dread. And believe it or not, this is actually not something that people despise, because I don't know if you've noticed it or not, especially if you've been around for a little while, we don't deal with money and giving the same way around here as most churches do. We just do it differently. I don't know if you've noticed, but we don't collect our traditional offering, and we don't base giving on guilt or pressure. Instead, what we've tried really hard to do over the past decade and a half is to create an environment where, first of all, I feel comfortable teaching you what God's Word has to say about stewardship and money and stuff, and you feel comfortable making up your own mind as to how to respond to it. Does that make sense? Give me a nod if that makes sense to you. Okay. We also decided a long time ago that the time to teach on stewardship and to lay a healthy foundation was not in the midst of any kind of financial or relational crisis in the church. That instead, the, the time to lay a healthy foundation is before any of that stuff comes along. And so, yes, over the past, I don't know, 16 years or so, we have experienced a couple of economic downturns. And those downturns have impacted people's jobs and their incomes, which in turn impacted our giving and the amount of resources that we have to work with as a church. But because we laid what I believe is a healthy foundation years ago, we don't have to dread talking about money and giving and stewardship whenever November rolls around, okay? So that's sort of the attitude and the approach that I come to you with this morning. And if you're fairly new to OBC, you may be, I think you're going to be kind of surprised at the lack of resistance to my teaching on stewardship that you're going to experience over this next month. Sometimes people conclude, well, they don't collect an offering, they don't use guilt or pressure, they don't really resist the teaching on stewardship. I know they must have so much money in this church that it's just not a big deal to them, right? Right? But I'm here to tell you that's not the case. I mean, listen, comparatively, we are certainly very blessed. Anybody want to doubt that? Anybody want to disagree with that? But does that mean that we've got all the money we need to do all the ministry we think God wants us to do? Typically, no. So don't misread our lack of resistance to the idea of stewardship as us being a church with no financial needs. That's just not the case. Read it instead as a church that, first of all, has invested in really good relationships with one another. And secondly, as a church that has worked really hard to build a healthy foundation when it comes to the topic of stewardship. All right? That's my disclaimer, and, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Now we're just going to move on like this is the most exciting topic we've ever covered. Amen? All right. Now, our theme for this series is going to be focused on the difference between prioritizing the almighty dollar a.k.a. stuff in our life, and prioritizing something different that God wants for each of us. In fact, the, the title, Almighty Dollar, is really a question. Are we going to prioritize the Almighty, or are we going to prioritize the dollar? It's a choice that we have to make. Now, interestingly, there's some potential for me to offend you in what I'm going to teach, and here's the reason why. Because I want to teach you how to do something that you already think you do. Actually, I want to teach you how to be something that you already think you are, but you're probably not. See, every one of you are givers. Everybody's a giver. You know how to give. 
You practice giving in lots of different ways. You're all givers. But being a giver and being generous are two very different things. Let me give you a couple of definitions to kind of get us started. And if you've got your message notes with you, I promise you, this is going to be one of those messages, really one of the series, that you're going to want to write some things down, okay? And I really want to encourage you to do it, even if that's not something you naturally are interested in. Use those message notes this morning. Let's start with a couple of definitions. Number one, definition, giving. Giving. Giving is the often random acts of sacrifice motivated by inspiration or guilt, all right? Make sure you've got that written down. The often random acts of sacrifice motivated by inspiration or guilt. Here's the second definition. Generosity. It's different. Generosity is the premeditated, calculated, designated emancipation of personal financial assets. I know that's a mouthful. I know that's a long sentence. Let me say it one more time. The premeditated, calculated, designated emancipation of personal financial assets. And over, over these next few weeks, we're going to break down that sort of crazy, complicated definition. We're going to work on each one of those words each week. But just right off the bat, do you get a sense of the difference between the two ideas of giving versus generosity? Giving, in a lot of ways, is just something that you do. Generosity, on the other hand, is something that you are. And I'm telling you, that's a big difference. But most of our thinking is centered around giving as opposed to generosity. What I want to show you today and next week is that generosity is actually a biblical concept and that generosity has, has some incredibly unexpected benefits that probably every person in this room would love to experience in their life. But again, we don't know as much about generosity as we think we do. Part of that is because of our focus on giving, and part of that is because of some myths that are actually associated with generosity. Now, you know me, I love a good myth. So let me show you a passage of scripture that identifies some of the myths surrounding generosity as well as it kind of gives us a, a sense of what some of the benefits might be in our lives. This is Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25. And the only thing I love more than a myth is a proverb, okay? I, I love the wisdom of Proverbs. Here's what it says in verse 24. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, I'm going to read that to you one more time, and I, I want to remind you of what I've told you a million times about Proverbs. When you look at the wisdom literature in the Scripture, what that, that is not a promise, okay? What we're about to read again, that's not a promise. What that is, is it's a reflection of what typically happens in the world God created. So most of the time, this is how things work out in the world of, that God has given us. Not always. It's not, it's not a rule. It's not a law. Okay? This tells us what normally happens. Let me read it again. I want you to think of it that way. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, do you see, first of all, that, that this proverb is actually implying some myths about generosity? Verse 24 says that a person gives freely, yet gains even more. What's the implication? They give freely, but they gain more. Common sense would tell us that if you have a certain amount of something, and you give freely or generously of that amount, if I give it to you, then I'm going to have less than I started with, right? I mean, that, that's just common sense. If I, give, if I give freely, I have less. The next part says that a different person has a certain amount, same amount, and holds on to it as tightly as he can. Common sense says he will now have what? Give me the word. He will now have more, or at least the same, than if he gave it away freely, right? If I hold on to it, then I get to keep the amount that I have. But then the author of Proverbs just turns everything on its head. He says, that's what you would expect to happen. Give it away, you're going to have less. Hold on to it as tightly as you can, you'll get to keep more. 
but generosity doesn't always conform to the rules of common sense. He says, in reality, the person who gives away generously ends up somehow with more. While the person who holds on tightly ends up with less. It's so strange. With less. Then he goes on to explain why this happens. Because generosity leads to supernatural blessing. He says that there's the myth and then there's the reality. The myth is based on what sort of comes naturally to us. The reality is based on something that does not come naturally to us. It's beyond natural. It is supernatural. And as you've probably heard me say before, when it comes to your finances, when it comes to your stuff, wouldn't you like some super attached to your natural? Yes or no? Well, of course you would, right? We all would. We would all like that. Now, before we finish with this passage, I want to remind you that a big part of my job when I'm teaching is to help you understand the truth of a scripture in its original context and then show you how it relates to a modern day context so that you can apply it in your life. That's what we're here for. We're not here just so I can entertain you. We're not here just so you know, we can feel good. We're here because we've got a job to do out there. And so working off of Proverbs 11, let me just be really, really practical. Let me give you four modern day myths that will help you kind of understand why generosity is so elusive in this world in which we live. First of all, here's myth number one. Generosity is spontaneous, okay? And again, I've really, I'm encouraging you to write this down. I want you to be able to think about this later. Generosity is spontaneous. One of the reasons that we're tempted to think that we're generous when we're really not is that we sometimes spontaneously give when we see a need. And, and this is not like a pride thing, but I think we're all going to raise our hand here. How many of you have ever just spontaneously given in your life? Raise your hand. I mean, it, it, it's not a big deal, right? We do that. We do that. We know how to give. We see a need. We're like, hey, I, you know what? I should give to that. Or somebody comes up to us. Have you ever had someone approach you in the parking lot at Walmart or, or at the gas pump at, at uh, let me throw it, let me, let me give a little plug here, uh, uh, on cue would be a good one, right? And somebody comes up and says, hey, I, I need some help. I need some gas. I need this. I need that. And, and maybe sometimes you're like, no, 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 you know, not today or I don't have any. But sometimes you're like, you know what, I've, you know, I've, got, I've got something, and you give. Spontaneously giving. It's something that, that we are comfortable with, we're used to, we've done it. And I do not want you to get me wrong. Giving spontaneously can absolutely be done with generosity. Here's what I need you to understand, though. It's just that spontaneous giving is not automatically generous. So the myth is generosity is spontaneous. But the reality is generous people are actually less emotional and more strategic in the way that they give. Now, do you know why? Well, it's because generosity is not so much about what we do as it is about who we are. What we're really talking about is not random acts of giving but instead a lifestyle of generosity. We're going to talk about that concept as we move forward in this series, a lifestyle of generosity. And I would suggest that it is a lifestyle of generosity that produces the super for your natural. Are you with me? Okay, here's myth number two. Generosity is determined by cash flow. And we all know that, right? Generosity is determined by cash flow. In other words, when you have plenty to give, you're generous. And when things are a little tight, you, you have to back off of the generosity a little bit. I mean, that's just like the most obvious thing in the whole world. But here's the reality. The reality is generous people are actually consistently generous. They're consistently generous. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. That's been my experience. Generous people tend to be generous no matter what their financial situation is. When they have a lot, they sacrifice a lot. And when they have a little, they, til they still tend to sacrifice a lot. And you may say, well, how is that possible? 
I mean, don't you have a responsibility to provide for your family? To take care of your responsibilities? You know what I say to that? Absolutely. 100% you have that responsibility. But there's a little secret surprise financial principle connected with generosity. And we'll talk more about this next week, but I just want to tease it out for just a minute right now. It, it's this. When you become generous, you will not only give more, you will save more. And here's the big surprise. And you will actually consume less. Let me read it again. When you become generous, you will not only give more, you will save more, and you will actually consume less. You say, well, that's definitely impossible, right? I mean, there's no way that that can be true. Not according to Proverbs 11, 24 and 25. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Do you see it? I'm not saying it makes sense. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying it's supernatural. But at least part of the reason you end up not only giving more and saving more, but consuming less when you live a lifestyle of generosity is because of something you probably heard plenty of times if you've been around OBC for a while. You begin to see yourself not as an owner, but as a, come on, make me proud, as a I love it as a steward. And I love your, your robot zombie response, steward. Yeah, that's, that, that really comes across well online. So good job. Good job on that, right? You, you begin to see yourself not as an owner you know, of all this stuff and all these things, but instead as a steward of these things. You begin to look at your life from the point of view of, I don't actually own anything, and here's why, because I know I cannot actually take anything with me when I die. That means I don't actually own it. That means it's all temporary, and that means everything I have, let's see if you got this one, belongs to God, come on, comes from God, thank you, and is given by God. You've heard that once or twice, right? Everything that I have belongs to God. It comes from God. It's given by God. The point is that while we tend to assume that generosity is determined by cash flow, the reality is that generous people are consistently generous, which means they give more, they save more, and they consume less. Here's myth number three. It's the amount that counts, right? It's the amount that counts when it comes to generosity. Have you ever been around somebody who gave a large amount of money to a charity or to a church or to a cause? And, and people on the outside looked at that situation. They said, oh, my goodness, they're so generous. Really, how do you know that? How do you know that they're generous? Because let me tell you something. I once had a church member, different church, who gave the church, are you ready? One million dollars out of the blue. Yeah, one million dollars. And you can believe that people said, oh, he is so what? Oh, oh, that's the most generous guy in our church. I mean, clearly, he's the most generous. What people didn't know is that that gift represented 2% of not his wealth, but the sale of a specific company he owned. Okay, 2%. And you know what that means? I want you to think about this. What that means is that the little old lady who that same Sunday dropped a $100 tithe check for the month in the offering plate actually gave five times as much as the guy who gave a million dollars. Now you tell me who was more generous. You see, when it comes to generosity, it is not the amount that counts. Although I will say, if anybody here has got a check for a million dollars burning a hole in your pocket, we will be good stewards of that million dollars, okay? We'll put it to, I promise, we'll put it to good use. When it comes to generosity, it's not the amount that counts. It's the sacrifice that actually counts. And that's why the biblical model for determining church support is based on a percentage, Biblically speaking, that's 10%. And because it's the sacrifice, not the amount that counts, you can be generous whether you make a whole lot of money, an average amount of money, or very little money. And to that I say, isn't God very smart? Isn't God a genius? It's not the amount, 
but the sacrifice that counts when it comes to generosity. All right, here's, here's myth number four. Rich people are generous, right? Rich people. And by the way, I don't even know what that means. I haven't met a person yet who thinks they're rich. Rich people are generous, and, and that's the myth. Rich, gener- rich people are generous because, let's face it, they've got a lot to work with. Rich people have been unusually blessed. They've saved really, really well. They've worked really, really hard, whatever it may be. Therefore, it's rich people who can be generous. But folks, I'm here to tell you that's a myth. Here's the reality. Generous people are generous. Okay? It's generous people who are are generous. Are you starting to pick up a, a pattern in all of this? You can be generous with a lot of money, or you can be generous with a little money. You don't need to wait until you have a lot to be generous. If you can be strategic, if you can be consistent, if you can give sacrificially, then you can be generous. And if you can be generous, you can know that there is a blessing attached to living that kind of a lifestyle. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, maybe you say, well, that's all great, Justin, but you don't know my finances, right? You don't know my responsibilities. You don't know how much my family consumes. You don't know how much we need to be saving that we aren't even saving, much less giving away. I mean, that's not happening. I actually do understand that. And if this were just me giving you my opinions, I could certainly understand why you'd be hesitant to jump off the deep end into generosity. And if this were just one passage indicating a blessing connected with generosity, I can understand why you might be a little leery of building your lifestyle around that idea. So let me show you another passage. And then let me challenge you with a way you can actually apply it. This is Acts chapter 20, verse 35. We were in the Old Testament, now we go to the New Testament. Acts 20, 35. You probably heard this verse a million times, usually right around Christmas when you were a little kid, okay? You're going to recognize it when we get into it. And here it is. This is the Apostle Paul speaking about generosity, Acts chapter 20. He says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Now, that sounds pretty generous, right? We must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. So this is not just the Apostle Paul, but Jesus himself who taught this principle of generosity. You ready? Here it is. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you remember that one? Were you ever taught that? Your parents are now. Now little Jamie, it's better to give than to receive, right? I, I guarantee you Mary Beth had something to say. Along those lines, right? It's more blessed than it is to give. Now, let me point out one thing here. The word blessed has a special meaning. The Greek word literally means, are you ready for this? Experiencing happiness. That's the blessing, experiencing happiness. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm not typically a happiness kind of guy, okay? Not that I'm not happy. It's just I'm not a health and wealth preacher And I'm not a self-help kind of teacher. And I don't particularly believe that happiness is the purpose for which God placed us on this planet. Partly because happiness is so fleeting and it's so hard to define. I'm just not a believer in happiness is the goal of Christianity. I just, I've never believed that. So when the word happiness or in this case, the idea of happiness shows up in a specific passage spoken by the Apostle Paul, quoting Jesus himself, I'm going to sit up and pay attention, right? And here is the conclusion I draw from Acts 20, verse 35. That somehow, supernaturally, unexpectedly, against the laws of nature, happiness is the outcome of a lifestyle of generosity. That's what they're trying to say to us. Happiness is the outcome of a lifestyle of generosity. 
Now, I, just, I want you to just stop for a second and look at that. Just think about that for a minute. Generosity. Something that, that we think of as very hard to be. Something that, that we think only rich people can be. Something that, that just sounds kind of crazy in a secular, logical context could actually bring some happiness into my life. Now, come on. If we can get past the fact that it sounds kind of crazy, would you agree that's worth exploring? That's worth understanding. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to talk about this over the next few weeks, but I want to do a little exercise with you to to finish up, okay? This is is actually a a standard uh, uh, psychological exercise. I want you to imagine that suddenly, magically, not the bad kind, the good kind, okay, mystically, you were given control of a checking account full of all the money you've wasted over the last five years. Now, some of you are already calculating. You're like, add the six and, you know. All right, I want you to imagine that suddenly... You've got this bank account that has been filled up with everything you've wasted over five years. And by wasted, you define wasted. I'm not going to tell you what waste is, okay? Whatever it is to you, you decide. I mean, maybe you think of that car that you could have kept longer and instead you traded it in. Maybe maybe you didn't need that couch. Or maybe you think of all the shoes, right? (laughs) Yeah, nervous laughter. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what's funny. If you're, if you're laughing at me and my wife, who owns more shoes? Her? Yeah, she's pointing at me. Yeah. yeah. Maybe for you it was a vacation that, that you should have kind of known better than to waste money on, but you just, you had to go there. You had to have it. Maybe, I've used this before and I get in trouble, so don't send me emails. It doesn't work. Maybe it was the boat you bought that has never actually physically touched water. You know what I'm talking about? Man, you're paying for it, but it's never been wet in its life. Maybe, maybe it's the you know twelve hundred dollars a year the average American spends on fast food. All right, let me let, let's just think for a second. That's twelve hundred. That's not family. That's not per family. Okay, twelve hundred times the number of people in your family times five comes to however you define waste. Okay, think of it like that. I just want you to imagine you've got a checking account full of all the money that you considered yourself to have wasted over five years. How much would be in there? How much would be in there? For some of you, it'd be like hundreds of dollars, right? Some of you, you live pretty simply and you don't waste a lot. It'd be a hundred, you know, maybe two or three hundred bucks. For most of us, it would be thousands of dollars, Yes. I mean, it'd be thousands of dollars. I'm suspecting in my family, it'd be thousands of dollars. For a handful, it might be hundreds of thousands of dollars. I read once that Steven Tyler, lead singer of Aerosmith, the guy with the big mouth, you know what I'm talking about? He estimates that he spent north of $6 million in his lifetime on cocaine. So I guess Steven would have like a big account to work with, okay? Okay. He's got lots of money in that account to to be able to work with. But here's the deal. You've got this account full of all the money you've wasted over five years, but, listen to me, you can't spend it. Okay? You've got thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can't spend it. You have to give it away. (gasps) Doesn't that hurt somewhere deep inside? In fact, you've got one month, you've got 30 days to give it all away or it disappears forever. Anybody ever see the movie Brewster's Millions with Richard Pryor? Yeah, sir. All right. All right. I maybe watched that this past weekend or maybe I didn't. I don't know. But here's the deal. Work with me here. After you get over the shock of realizing how much you've wasted how big that account is with all that money, and the shock of not being able to spend it on yourself, can you imagine how fun it would be to give all that money away? Come on. Come on. Can you imagine how fun it would be to plan that out, to grab your kids and sit around the kitchen table 
and to calculate, okay, I, I, I'm going to give this percentage over here, and I'm going to give this percentage over there to designate. Man, I have always wanted to give to that ministry, or I've always wanted to support you know, that particular missionary. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be fun just to set all that money that you've wasted free into the world? And can you guess the kind of emotions that you would experience? You wouldn't be possessive about it. You wouldn't be regretful. I'm telling you, you would experience the joy of living a generous life. Would that not be just absolutely incredible? So here's my question. Are you ready? Why not just do that going forward? Why not just do it? Why not just live that way? Because guess what? I'm going to teach you how. You come back next week, I'm going to show you an incredibly simple way to order your financial life around generosity that will actually allow you to enjoy being generous. And it's not my plan, by the way. It's the biblical plan. Okay, so let's come back next week and let's not only find out what our responsibilities are. How about this? Let's ask God to put his super on our natural in the arena of our finances. Heavenly Father, I think most of us are still sort of getting over the shock, God, of thinking about how, mon how much money would be in an account that we'd wasted over five years. But I think everybody here can understand how enjoyable it would be to give that money away. I think everybody here can understand what it would feel like to be generous in that situation. And God, what I pray that, that you would help us with is to show us that that generosity is something we can live out every day. We don't need some imaginary situation. We can actually live that. You have given us an idea of how to do that from your word. And God, I pray that over these next few weeks, that you would just show us what that could look like in our life. And here's the other thing that comes to my mind, God. Maybe there's somebody sitting here this morning who doesn't know you, who's never placed their faith in you. And I realize they may wonder, well, you know, what does this have to do with my salvation? What does this have to do with my eternity? I, I came to church hoping to find some answers for, for the emptiness I feel, for the, the hole that feels like is in my heart. What does this have to do with that? Well, God, would you remind us you are the model for generosity? You're the most generous that's ever been. And you gave so freely when you gave your son to die in our place for our sins. And you said, if you'll put your faith and your trust in me, I will save you. And I will spend eternity with you. So God, if there's somebody here this morning struggling with their eternity. And I pray that you would speak right to their hearts about it. And for those of us who are Christians, may we understand you are the model for generosity. And this is a characteristic we're supposed to be living out in our life. And not only is it a responsibility, God, it's something that we're going to enjoy in a way that will really surprise us. God, I thank you for your word speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray.